Thunderball was released in December 1965 and sees James Bond, once again played by Sean Connery, heading out to the Bahamas, where he has to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Spectre Agent Number 2, Emilio Largo. How do we know that he's a villain? Well, he's conveniently wearing an eye patch. Largo is masterminding a plot to ransom, well, the world into giving over to Spectre a hundred million dollars worth of diamonds for the safe return of two NATO atomic bombs they have stolen. If they don't receive the bounty, they threaten to blow up either a city in the UK or the US. While in Nassau, Bond meets Domino, who is Largo's mistress, and after one night with the double O agent, is more than happy to dump her spectre boyfriend and help the British foil the terrorists' plot. Bond, with the help of his CIA agent Felix Leiter, now played by Rick Van Neuter, needs to find the atomic bombs before it's too late. The production of Thunderball has a rather interesting past. It was originally meant to be the first big screen Bond adventure, and initially, at least, not based upon one of Ian Fleming's novels. Ian Fleming in the early 1950s had gone to screenwriter Kevin Clory to help him write a James Bond film. But as things went along, Fleming lost interest and instead sold the rights to James Bond to Saltzman and Broccoli, and they made Doctor No. However, Ian Fleming would later use that failed script and turn it into a Bond novel called Thunderball. Unfortunately, he didn't credit McClory and he promptly sued Fleming on its release. It was eventually settled out of court and fearing that McClory would just make his own Bond film, producers Saltzman and Broccoli decided to partner with him and make Thunderball next. McClory would get original story credit for the film and sole producer credit as well. Ian Fleming was however not around to see all this play out as he had died during the production of Goldfinger. It's sad to reflect that he only got to see two of his Bond films get to the screen, but at least he was happy and heavily involved in their productions. To direct the film, they returned to Guy Hamilton, who'd just done Goldfinger for them, but he felt burned out. So they turned to original Bond director, Terence Young, and he was brought back to the series. Before I sat down and watched this film, um, I honestly couldn't remember anything about it, other than the fact that quite a lot of it took place underwater. The story starts with Bond, pre-credits, taking out a Spectre agent who has faked his own death and dressed as his own widow. It's a wild scene, and actually a great fight between Sean Connery and his stunt double, who also, until this film, was the James Bond in those gun barrel sequences. After the fight, James Bond flees the scene in a jetpack, a real working military device used for the film, and he lands and escapes in his now restored DB5 as the credits begin. Although I couldn't remember this opening sequence, it is pretty good. But now let's turn attention to Tom Jones singing the Thunderball theme song. For me, it's not a classic Bond theme at all, as it's far too reminiscent of Goldfinger. However, it makes no sense, as there isn't a character uh, called Thunderball in the film, so I'm not sure what Tom Jones is actually singing about here. Originally, Dionne Warwick's song Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang was written for the film and even had a title sequence made for it, but ultimately it was dropped as Saltzman and Broccoli didn't want to use a song that didn't include the title of the film in it. When the film starts properly, we spend a long time with Bond at a spa getting some time off, but while there he still has to keep an eye out for a Spectre agent. This whole opening sequence has some really good moments. The scene where someone comes in and turns Bond's traction engine into a death machine is wonderfully ludicrous. Why on earth would this machine ever have this kind of setting? And we do get the reintroduction of Spectre agent number one Blofeld in another elaborate layer, where he takes out an embezzling employee in fantastic fashion via an electric chair that then sinks into the floor. This kind of stuff is all great fun, but the story is actually spending too long with characters that don't factor into the plot for the rest of the movie, and we get a Spectre agent going through plastic surgery to look like a NATO pilot in order to capture the atomic bombs. And I would absolutely love to say that this is the last time that somebody uses reconstructive surgery to uh, get away from Bond, but uh, unfortunately I can't. 
And the problem I have with all this setting up of the story is that it gives us everything too soon. And so for the rest of the film, I'm not left with any mystery to uncover. And the film just takes too long to get to James Bond and get the rest of the story started. We also have a load of Bond girls in this film that unfortunately are very forgettable. There's mistresses and sisters and all sorts of things going on. Also, Bond is at his most kiss kiss bang bang here and that phrase um, different times just kept coming to mind. But I found it very hard to actually like James Bond in this film. The charm is wearing a bit thin for me. I'm sure Connery was getting bored too. He churned out a Bond film a year for four years straight and they aren't small movies and I'm sure it was taking a toll on him. For me, he doesn't seem that invested in the film and rather checked out. Saying that, he does get in a few good one-liners. <laughs> I think you got the point. This film is most well remembered today for its use of underwater photography and it isn't underutilised at all. While watching films from this time I've always got to remember that these films were never intended to be watched on television, they were always meant for the big cinema screen. And when I think of it like that, these underwater scenes must have been transportative to mid-60s audiences. I love it when Bond films go into travel log mode and gives a flavour of a far-flung place that would have been out of reach to audiences of the time. And I think this film works best when it is actually beneath the waves. The film culminates in an epic underwater battle that is like something from a western. Handily, the goodies wearing a different colour wetsuit to the baddies, so we don't get confused. But joking aside, I think it's a really great sequence that still looks great today, and I would love to see this projected onto a big screen. This is also the first Bond to be shot using the higher quality Panavision camera system, and the results in the new 4K remaster are plain to see. This is the best looking Bond so far. But on the other hand, the story just lets it down, and no matter how great it looks, it doesn't recover for me. After the highs of From Russia With Love and Goldfinger, this film takes a dive. The story isn't very interesting, with little to keep me invested for its over two hour running time. And the villain in Emilio Largo has some new sadistic elements to him, but ultimately he's quite forgettable. I won't be rushing out to watch this film again, not all the way through anyway. I'll probably just dip into the underwater sequence at the end. Thank you very much for watching my Thunderball review and just before I go I wanted to share with you a really great behind the scenes story. For that final epic explosion of Largo's yacht called the Disco Volante, the crew packed the boat out with a load of experimental rocket fuel. When they detonated, the stunt supervisor was amazed that when the smoke dissipated the whole yacht had been atomized. They dusted themselves off and went back to shore, which was 30 miles away, mind, and they found when they got there all the windows along Bay Street in Nassau had been blown out completely. It was only because they were so close to the explosion that they weren't ripped to bits. Quite rightly, perhaps, the special effects supervisor of the film, John Steers, won an Oscar for his work here. Next week in my James Bond reviews, I'm taking a bit of a left turn and reviewing my first non-official James Bond film, and that's 1967's Casino Royale. Supposedly, it's a spoof and a comedy. We'll see about that. Anyway, join me next week so we can bop along to some Herb Albert. Um, and please let me know your thoughts about Thunderball in the comments down below. And re-watch all of my other James Bond reviews just to get yourself caught up. But until then, I'll say thank you very much for watching and goodbye. <laughs>